Now I would like to bring up our speaker, and I am honored to introduce Catlin Tucker, who is a Google certified teacher, a Q lead learner, and currently teaches high school at Windsor High and has on a daily basis 170 students that report to her and she reports to. I have seen Kate, uh, I have seen Catlin pre um, pre present before and she is very dynamic and I'll tell you the things that she has shared with me and online what I would give if I could turn the clock back and be one of her students. It, I would just absolutely love that. So, I would like to now bring up Catlin Tucker. So I wanna make sure this is working. We can hear me? Yeah? Good. So this is a really surreal experience for me as last year I was sitting right where you guys all are and so it is such a pleasure to be here speaking to educators as an educator in the public school system in California which is challenging um, and sharing some of the things that I'm doing to try to amplify curiosity, inspire kids and teach the common core in new and kind of creative ways. But my story um, really began four years ago. Um, I had an experience with technology that changed me. And um, before that, I was very much your traditional English teacher. I taught primarily with books and paper and pen. That's how I was taught. That was how I was taught to teach. Um, and I was drowning. I was drowning under piles of paperwork. Um, I felt overworked. I definitely felt underappreciated. Um, and I kept thinking, like, am I going to be able to do this job for the next 30 years? And at that point, honestly, the answer was no. Um, I was so frustrated by my students' lack of engagement. Um, there unwillingness to share, their unwillingness to engage with each other in an authentic way, their unwillingness to take risks. Um, and I definitely felt like I was battling a pattern of passivity. These kids who just wouldn't engage with me. They wouldn't engage with each other. Um, and I really saw this at first as a failing on my part. Um, I feel like I was doing something wrong. Like, why couldn't I get these kids to get excited and to get involved? Um, and I realized they had been trained. They had been well trained to sit quietly and to listen to consume information. And here I am asking them to take risks, to communicate, to get involved, um, and, and they weren't willing to do that. And so I grieved. I, I went through the seven steps of the grieving process, and I grieved for this classroom that I imagined. In credential school, I mean, some most of the time I was listening to the lectures, but some of the time I was just daydreaming about the classroom that I would create. And I was grieving for the classroom that I wanted to create, but I couldn't. I couldn't make that classroom a reality. Um, I was kind of shocked because I feel like a super type A dynamic person. If I put my mind to something, I'm going to make it happen. I couldn't make this happen. Um, I felt like guilt, like I'm not doing something right. Clearly I'm inadequate if I can't get these students to engage. Um, then I started getting a little angry because here I am doing everything I know how to do to engage these kids and nothing's happening. So I felt angry with my kids. And so my journey really began when I started reflecting about what was happening in my classroom, what did I want to happen, and how could I change things. And something that I really appreciate about the Common Core is what I perceive to be this shift. This shift from what students need to know, all of the information, the content, the minutia, to what students need to be able to do, really the skills. And if students can do something with the information, clearly they understand it. Um, and I like that because really one of my main goals is to push, 
shove, whatever verb you want to use, students from this consumption role into a role of production. Instead of sitting quietly and absorbing information, which is what most of them had been taught to do, I wanted them to actively produce information. Um, and that was a big leap for a lot of students in my class, but I see it honored in the Common Core, and that excites me as a teacher. Um, so four years ago, three and a half, I stumbled on a discussion platform, Collaborize Classroom. Actually, somebody um, said, hey, you know, I was probably complaining about how discussions weren't going anywhere. I should note that um, during my work as in my master's, my entire master's thesis was focused on how do I get, like, create the safe space in my physical classroom so that I can engage students in these dynamic conversations to drive higher order thinking. Simple, right? No, not simple. Um, I failed. I literally failed for seven years to get any kind of interesting, dynamic conversations happening in the classroom. And it wasn't a, like a little fail. It was an epic failure. The same three or four students engaged and dominated the conversation, and the rest of the kids were literally avoiding eye contact. It looked like they wanted to just will themselves to disappear. Um, and so I figured, okay, I have this opportunity to take conversations online, and, and I had a lot of fear factors in terms of taking conversations into the online space. You know, what if students are disrespectful? What if students, um, like how long is this gonna take to facilitate? I was already super swamped. Um, how am I seamlessly gonna get my, at that point, 158 kids, I like to call that the good old days, um, online seamlessly, right? Um, how am I going to assess their participation? What do I do about the kids who don't have access? So I had some really big fears that made me hesitate. And then probably one day in class when I tried to have another discussion that fell flat, I decided, what the hell? Discussions can't get any worse. So I decided to try it. And the first three students to respond, within 20 minutes of me posting that first discussion question, kids who never talk in my class. Super sweet, super quiet kids. And I had this like, oh my gosh, moment. Like, these kids want a voice in my class, but for whatever reason, they are not comfortable engaging in real-time conversations. But they're excited and eager to share their ideas online. Um, so I call Collaborize Classroom my gateway technology because it really did open the door for me to try other technologies. And I'm going to show you a lot of student work and a lot of things I'm doing with kids and a lot of different tools. And what I'll say is this. You don't need to walk away and ha try a bunch of tools at one time. You can find that one tool that is really going to complement what you do in the classroom and try it out, make a bunch of mistakes, because you're going to, and then add to it. So really, my advice is to do just that while you're here at Q. Um, find that tool, find that piece of technology that speaks to you, that does something that maybe you're not able to do effectively in the classroom. Try it out, make mistakes, learn a lot, be really patient with yourself because it can be super frustrating, um, and then expand. And so for me, this is where I, I really started to create what I call my technology tool belt. And my technology philosophy is really centered around a tool belt approach. And I, I know a lot of people who have had a lot of success with large learning management systems. That said, a large learning management system, I know and many people have been turned off by them, or districts who adopt one and say, okay, all of our teachers are using this. We're a technology-rich school now. It's super daunting. Um, and I equate the, the large LMS, it's like, it's like a big virtual backpack. You know, you can carry a lot of stuff in it, but it's cumbersome, and if you want to use what's inside, you got to take it off, you got to unzip it, hope the zipper doesn't get caught on whatever that weird piece of fabric that covers the zipper is. 
I don't know what this is for. And then you got to take stuff out. You got to find what you need and you got to use it. Um, and I was walking my daughter to school and I was looking at, and I do this every morning, and I see all these little kindergartners and they have these enormous backpacks on. They're literally like inches from the ground. Um, they're even designing lunch boxes that you can snap to the backpack now that make them even bigger. Uh, and I'm thinking, God, what if one of these poor kids gets knocked over? It'd be like a turtle on its back. And that's how I feel about some of the LMSs. They're just a little bit cumbersome, um, and they're daunting, and they tend to have a steeper learning curve just because there's a lot of bells and whistles. So they offer a lot, and for some teachers, that's great. For some teachers who are new to technology, it's just a little daunting. So. I like to advocate for the tool belt approach, um, where you really do grab a tool, try it out. If it works, fantastic, add it to your tool belt, um, and do what works for a given situation. Um, and for me, I'm trying to cultivate students who are, at the very least, at the very least, technology literate. And at the very most, or the very best, technology fluent. Um, and some people might be wondering, well, what's really the difference between these two? Um, and I'll speak to that. But the kids that are, you know, technology literate, they know the how. You know, they know how to use a tool. They know what to do with the tool. But kids who are technology fluent, they know when to use a tool, and they know why a specific tool is the best tool to get a job done. And it's easier to cultivate that technology fluency, I believe, with the tool belt. Because as a teacher, if you're using multiple tools, students get to experiment with multiple tools. They, they start to understand that different tools do different jobs, and they have different strengths and limitations. Um, and one tool isn't going to work for every situation. And I like that. Because in life, where is the LMS? It doesn't exist. There's not one solution for every problem. Every tool does something different or meets a different problem or situation. And I want my kids to understand that. And they're not going to love every tool I use or we use in the classroom, and that's fine. Um, and in fact, I think that's good because we can't really get attached to any one tool because they're changing so quickly, they're rapidly evolving, some disappear, new ones pop up. Um, and I think that's important for students to understand as well. So there, for me, are some points of emphasis that when I was becoming acquainted with the Common Core really stood out for me and resonated with me. Now, I will say, last year I was on sabbatical writing my first book on blended learning for the K-12 space, and so I had the time to explore the standards on my own terms. It wasn't like I was in an administrative meeting and my principal was like, you have to shift to these standards. That would have set an entirely different tone for me. You know, I'm an oldest child, I'm super type A. I got the bossy thing down, but I'm not real fond of people telling me what I have to do. Um, so when I was able to digest it on my own, I started seeing some things that really I saw and appreciated and I thought were very valuable. So the emphasis on communication, um, and not just oral presentations, which are in the California state standards, but communication in its variety of forms, right? Students, the way they communicate is changing, um, and they, many of them communicate virtually more than they communicate in person. And I think the Common Core honors the variety of contexts that communication takes place in, and the variety of mediums that it can take place in as well. Then collaboration, and I hear this term all the time, um, you know, this importance of students working together to accomplish something, to produce something. Higher order thinking, going kind of up Bloom's pyramid beyond just remembering things, but really being able to analyze and synthesize to evaluate and research. Students, so many of my kids are walking around with little computers in their pockets, but do they know how to find information? Can they evaluate the information they find? Can they analyze it? Can they use it to do something? Um, I don't know. I don't know if a lot of my kids enter my class with those skills. Um, I love, I mean, I'm biased. I'm an English teacher. So I love that reading and writing and literacy are really sprinkled throughout all the subject areas, science, history, even in math. They have to be able to explain how they approached a problem. They have to be able to critique the process of others. 
And then clearly the media and literacy, they're not a separate set of standards. The technology and media literacy are woven, or the standards are really woven throughout the fabric of the Common Core. And I think that really mirrors the ways in which technology is woven through the fabric of our own lives. So I want to start with communication and talk about how I teach communication, um, some of the ties to the Common Core. So I said I started with online discussions. And this is super convenient for me, because when I started looking at the Common Core, um, I realized that with my online discussions, I was simultaneously addressing multiple standards. And what I love about technology integration is this ability to really teach students a variety of skills with a single task or with a single project. And so in our online discussion space, I can embed informational text. Students are reading. They're, they have to write their ideas down. Everything in the online space is, takes the written form. They have to express their ideas clearly to communicate with their peers. Um, and they have to publish and produce writing online. So I've replaced literally 90% of my pen and paper homework with online discussions and then collaborative work on Google Docs. Um, and online discussions have the benefit for me, they're sustainable. And sustainability isn't necessarily a concept that a lot of us associate with education. But to be honest, we have to be really cognizant of what we're doing and whether it's sustainable. Um, technology can't be an add-on. It can't be a frill. I, I really believe to be sustainable, our technology integration has to replace and improve what we already do to make us more effective, to improve learning outcomes for students. I complement our online discussions with in-class conversations. And the one byproduct of our online conversations that I did not anticipate at all was how fluid those skill sets, the, the communicating online, how fluidly they would transfer into my physical classroom. Um, I routinely have to stop conversations to shift to the next activity. Um, because students are so eager to share, discussions have been absolutely transformed in my physical space because online students have had the chance to think about a question, read their peers' responses, analyze those responses, reply in a thoughtful way. And those shy kids, the ones who are hesitant to participate in real time, all of a sudden they've been validated. Um, ha their other classmates have responded to their ideas. And for many of them, these shy kids who never talk, this is the first time they have ever been truly heard. Ever truly heard by their peers. And it's been incredible to me to see the way in which this online piece, when combined with face-to-face -face communication, has really made our conversations, our discussions, our interactions and so interesting and changed the flow of ideas in our classroom from this very traditional teacher to student and really engaged the variety of members in my class. Because I am the first person to admit that our collective potential in a classroom far exceeds the potential of any one individual, myself included. And I want to tap into that collective potential and intelligence as much as possible. So I had a random Skype brainstorming session um, with a couple of educators over the summer. And I was, we were talking about how to engage students. And out of it came this idea for four corner conversations. And this is a routine I do every single day in class. And it's a way to extend on, to build on the ideas that are shared in the online discussion space. It also gets students really practicing those speaking and listening skills in pairs, in small groups. And so what I've done is I put, I, at the beginning of the year, I pinned questions to all four corners of my classroom. And there were questions that came from the online discussions or questions where I wanted them to extend the online conversations. And then I would just count them off and they would go into a corner. And they'd have these small group discussions about topics. And it was so nice to create these smaller learning communities within my 
growing class size, right? And so students were engaging. I told them they all had to be on the same level, sit in chairs, sit on the ground. And then we looked, we talked about what does it look like to be a good listener? So it's been so great to combine the online space and those conversations with the conversations happening in the classroom. Now that we've hit second semester, I've encouraged students and I've kind of started passing over the reins to them where I'll post, you know, a Google form and I'll have them submit a question about the reading, about an, a topic, a theme that we're discussing, and then I'll take the best ones and have those students lead the discussions. So really what I'm hoping for is by the end of the year, students are designing all the discussion topics, they are facilitating all the conversations um, to really own those, to learn how to not only be an active participant in a discussion that's driven by questions a teacher designed, but to really start thinking critically about the things we're working on in the classroom and own that and become the people who ask the great questions. I've also done some really fun stuff this year with mobile technology. I am in a very low-tech classroom. I have a computer on my desk. I, this year, have a used computer that was donated by the Santa Rosa Recycling Center after I wrote a nice email. Um, and then I have a, a used LCD projector and a roll-around transparency machine that is definitely older than me. And so I've had to be super creative about how can I harness the technology that my kids bring to the table, you know, their connectivity at home, as well as their mobile devices. And a lot of, you know, teachers, they're dealing with, you know, bring your own device issues in schools or mobile policies that aren't super welcoming. But I will tell you that leveraging mobile devices in my classroom, welcoming all devices, any and all, come please, to my classroom, um, has transformed my low-tech classroom into what feels like a technology hub. And not every kid has a phone, the smartphone, it can get on the internet, but it is amazing what you can do if one in four, one in five, even one in six kids has a phone. And an increasing number of kids are walking through my door with these phones that can get online. And so I do a lot of kind of unconventional sharing. I get students together. I'm very, I want a very, my goal is a student-centered classroom. That's, technology is not the goal. Technology is the vehicle to get students to produce, to engage in this student-centered classroom. Um, and so sometimes after their conversations, their research, I'll send them out into the quad and I'll say, okay, leave me a, a Google voice message and tell me what questions you had, what you learned, what insights, you know, sh just share whatever you're thinking with me. And then that was so successful, although I will say the first time that my students had to call me on the phone, even though it's not my real phone number, they were like, oh my god, we're leaving a message for Tucker. And I got all these like hilarious messages, which was a teachable moment as well. Like how do you leave a message? This is a skill. Let's, I just embraced it and made it a teachable moment. We just started Shakespeare, Romeo and Juliet. And I wanted to do something fun with the prologue. And so I had students group up and they went out onto the campus, and there was about four, three to five, four in a group, and I asked them to perform the prologue. And I said, it's a chorus that performs it. Sometimes it's interpreted as one person or many people. You can be as creative as you want with this. And then I started listening to these after school, and with my, actually my kids, uh, and a couple of the groups, I had, I had groups dramatically like in their version of Elizabethan uh, speech reading these. I had some kids beatboxing their prologue and kids rapping it. I mean, kids taking risks that they would never take if I had asked them to do it in real time, like in front of the class or in front of me. Oops, my earrings, a little jingly. Um, so just really fun ways to get students communicating. And when I hear collaboration, and collaboration seems to be used almost synonymously with 21st century skills. I can't read anything about 21st century skills without reading about collaboration and how important collaboration is. But you can't get to collaboration if kids don't know how to communicate effectively. So that's really where I start. Um, and then collaboration, once they know how to communicate, um, then they can engage in a meaningful way to work towards some kind of outcome. Um, and one of the, one of the things I, I really like about collaboration and, and technology integration is the opportunity to do more project-based learning 
scenarios. Um, and I think I read something by Vicki Davis. Uh, you guys on Twitter will know her as Cool Cat Teacher. And she wrote this really great piece where she said, as teachers, we need to move from the to-do list to the to-be list. Instead of what do we need to do, what do we want our students to be? And what, how can we design opportunities to cultivate that kind of student? Well, I want my students to be independent thinkers. I want my students to feel empowered, that they can make a difference, they can change a situation around them. I want them to be critical thinkers. I want them to be able to find really high quality information, evaluate it. Um, and so I decided to do a challenge-based learning project, and I was working with a science teacher and a history teacher, um, and we chose the big idea of sustainability. And challenge-based learning is an idea out of Apple. It's a fabulous project structure. Um, and so you start with this big idea, sustainability. And students could choose environmental sustainability, social sustainability. Um, and then they really had to work in groups, self-selected groups, to identify what aspect of sustainability they were interested in and talk about it and identify a real-world challenge connected to this aspect of sustainability that they wanted to tackle. And so here you're going to see, just a scrolling down, one of the ways that I was able to facilitate a long-term project like this, and we took the, over the course of two and a half months, was getting students collaborating not just in my physical classroom, but online as well. So each group started a Google document, and then they collaborated on that Google document. For every single step, it became a living document of their project and their work. So they asked questions about their challenge. They, you know, they had research that they started adding to the document. And I weaseled, I weaseled the research paper right in there because as an English teacher, I just couldn't help myself. Um, and once they had researched, um, and I had supported them in that research, you know, how do you search smarter? How do you analyze information you find online? They had to create a real-world solution that they could actually implement their school community, our community at large, larger community. Um, and it was only because they had the time and space to really engage online and collaborate and work together and bounce ideas around that I was able to do that. Because in the past, I kind of shied away from projects, um, especially large-scale ones, because I didn't feel like I had the time. I felt like every day I was in a race against the bell to get through the myriad of standards that I was supposed to cover as a ninth and 10th grade teacher. And the shift from, you know, breadth, uh, or yeah, breadth to depth with the Common Core, I like. I think it creates opportunities to authentically, like, inspire students with projects-based opportunities that really get them thinking about issues that hopefully they can act on. And then they shared multimedia projects that they put together, documenting their solutions, and they presented it. So within one project, you have them communicating in person, online, collaborating, using the internet, using Google Docs. You have them designing and, impl and implementing a real world solution. You have them using med media strategically to show their peers what they did, um, publishing it out into the larger community, and then we made them present the oral, com you know, the oral component piece to our core of, you know, each day was about 80 students, 85, 90 students. So then you got those formal speaking and listening skills. And I just wouldn't have been able to do it without this online piece. And as you see it scrolling down here, you can see the revision history. How many times each of these kids and myself touched this document um, to make this, you know, project happen. I also started exploring how to use things like, you know, Google Hangouts with my kids. So as they were designing solutions, some of them were biting off a little more than they could chew. Uh, and then some of them were not thinking big enough. And so I wanted to build in time to connect with them. And so I had opportunities for them to come in classroom during lunch and meet with me during my prep or, like I said, lunch. Or if that doesn't work for you because you're super busy, let's collaborate using a Google Hangout. And I had times that they could sign up for that were outside of class time. Um, and that was something I was willing to do because I really believed in the project. And this is an example. So this was in the evening. Just me, three boys in their group, having a conversation about their challenge-based learning project. Um, 
I wish I could have captured a screencast of this conversation because it would have been comical. Um, but it was so great for them. We were able to bandy about ideas, and it made their end result so much stronger. And it helped me to inspire them to try using these kind of tools just as a group. You don't need me there. You can collaborate using something like uh, Google Hangout anytime you want to talk about a project that you're working on. And then what I loved was seeing some of the finished products. Kids who were, you know, doing the creek cleanup, trying to raise awareness about things like pollution, creating their own websites to kind of share information, going to the middle school and giving talks about things like cyberbullying and how to, you know, how to stop it on your campus, and really taking action um, and realizing they can make a difference. Now, research is also stressed throughout the Common Core. And I said, I, I eked in a research paper um, while we were doing the Common Core or the Challenge Based Learning Project. And I graded all these research papers. I had provided a template, showed them exactly how to go through it. They had a Google form, how to evaluate online resources. We had time in the computer lab. I did formative assessment. I jumped on their docs and gave them a, a lot of feedback throughout. And then at the end, I realized, you know what these kids need? They need to research, research, and research some more. But what I did not want to do was read 170 more research papers because, oh my gosh, what is like, it's like trudging through the mud, you know, writing a research paper. So I had to take a step back and start to think, okay, they need this skill, they need more practice, I don't want to read all these papers. I need to rethink about what research could look like. And one of the things I love are infographics. Infographics are all over the internet right now. It's so interesting, visually stimulating. Um, it's easily digestible. So I thought, OK, I'm going to let them choose a nonfiction focus that is like a, some idea that's related to the literature we're reading. They're going to research it, and they're going to create an infographic. And I found a really easy tool called PictoChart. And I got them into the computer lab. We have one functional computer lab for a campus of 1750. But I got them in, luckily. And they started designing these infographics. At first, they spent the first half of one block researching, and then the second half of a block designing. And then we went in again so they could continue designing. And infographics are deceptively challenging. Not only do you have to find quality information and evaluate it, but you have to figure out how to strategically arrange that media to convey some kind of point. And my students chose some of the most interesting topics related to modern day slavery, women's rights and gender inequality, um, and they created these infographics. Are they perfect? No. Were they really great? Were they really excited to do them? Yes. I was walking through the computer lab, and one student actually said, I love this. Like he, like he sounds surprised. I love this. I, do people do this for a living? I would love to do this for a living. This has been such a fun activity. And for me, he wouldn't have probably said that after research paper number two. So rethinking how we approach things like research. Literacy across disciplines. Now, I get super pumped about the idea of reading and writing being stressed in every subject. I'm not sure that all that writing probably excites the science and history teachers. I, I don't know where we all stand on that. But I love the sense or this idea that students will be doing more reading and writing. It's not just isolated in my class, um, in the English classes. And so really, in the Common Core, there's a stress on close reading, finding details, analyzing them, citing them properly. Um, and there's this emphasis on informational text. And so on the your right side, I have actually a traditional book. This is a picture of one of my students' books after we finish reading I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings. And I make them annotate all of the literature that we read. And I hear a lot of teachers, even in my department, when faced with this idea of, oh, we have to teach more nonfiction, we have to teach informational text. Like, we need to order some books. We need an anthology of nonfiction. And I'm thinking, uh, we have the internet. Like, maybe a better use of funds 
would be to get more students online and teaching them how to digest digital text because more and more texts are available online. And so I've been using Digo as a way to get students to annotate, make notes, comment, and share their online reading with me. I want them to start to learn how to organize and analyze and digest the digital resources that they're reading so I can incorporate those nonfiction pieces. Um, and as English teachers, I think a lot of English teachers in my department are really fearful. Like, what does this mean? Um, does this mean we have to like give up our, our literature? Like, we love our literature. And no, we do not need to give up our literature. Students fall in love with stories. So we don't want to get rid of our stories. In fact, I go so far as with my high school students, every week and a half, at least, I do story time. They sit on the floor, and I read to them, and I tell them, because I do it the first day of school, kind of to see what their reaction will be. They think I'm crazy, which is fine. Um, and so they get on the floor, and I tell them. I say, you know what? All of the kids, like most of the high school kids who enter my door, I get a lot of like, I don't like to read. Why do you have to read so much in this class, you know? And at some point, they loved to read, right? Like, I have a four-year-old and a five-year-old, um, and like story time is the most exciting time of the day. And I'm a little embarrassed to admit this, but like when they're not acting the way I want them to act, I'm like, do you want to lose your stories? <laughs> like that, that's the big punishment at our house. You're going to lose your stories. And I said, at some point you love this. And I want you once in a while or once every week, every week or two, and if I go beyond a week and a half, then I start hearing about how we haven't had story time, um, for them to rediscover their joy in the story. So the standards don't mean that we have to give up our stories, but they may challenge us to think about how can we ground our stories in real world issues, real world themes, and start pulling in those nonfiction texts that are really going to complement the literature and maybe make those readings more meaningful. During my Kill a Mockingbird unit, we did a whole thing on the death penalty because we were going to be voting in November in California whether to keep or get rid of the death penalty. Um, and I wanted students to research it, wanted them to debate it, have conversations. Um, and then they ended up writing an argument essay about where they stood on the issue. And I had them think about, you know, racial inequality in the justice system. I had them thinking about the financial costs. So it wasn't just more the morality, it was all the whole picture. And then after they had written their argument essays, they wrote a letter, a business letter, to our local representation saying, hey, I'm in ninth and 10th grade, I've been studying this, I can't vote, but here's my opinion. And it was so powerful, and I think it made the Tom Robinson trial in To Kill a Mockingbird that much more interesting for them. I've also been trying to figure out how I can be more effective with 170 students teaching writing. Um, it's so daunting to get students writing over small and large time periods um, when you have 170 kids. And so when I can get them into the computer lab, something that I was playing with, I just actually just wrote a blog about this last week, is how to give, you know, this, this Syn synchronous, you know, at the same time. They're working on it and they're getting feedback, the synchronous feedback from me. And so I took them to the computer lab and you see all those tabs open. Those were all the kids who had done the homework and started their introduction paragraph and shared their doc with me. And so I opened every tab and I said, we're going to be in this room together, but we're not going to talk. If you need me, use the instant message feature on your document because I'm going to be going through and in the space of 90 minutes, I was able to touch every single document, leaving pretty substantial comments not only in the sidebar, but also when a student was on at the same time, answering real-time questions. And it was such, a, it's such an easy way to use technology, and it was so much more effective. It was so much, there was that human connection, instead of taking all those papers home and trying to give them formative feedback, give them back just so I could collect them again to give them the summative feedback. So thinking about how we can use things like Google Docs to get students online, to collaborate with them, give them more meaningful feedback. Another stressed point of stress in the Common Core is this higher order thinking and really pushing students to analyze, to synthesize, to evaluate, and then hopefully to create something. And so usually it's really hard to get this done in the real time classroom. Um, you know, it's 
most of the time we ask students to analyze something or evaluate it, we're assigning it for homework. Um, and then that's, those are higher order, those, those higher order thinking skills are hard to do when you're by yourself. You hit a bump, who are you going to ask? Who do you lean on? So the ideal space for this is really when students are together in a physical location with a subject area expert who can help them if they hit a bump or they have a question instead of feeling like they're failing at home by themselves. Um, and that's really when I, I explored, started exploring the flipped classroom. Um, and I've heard the criticisms of the flipped classroom for sure that, you know, it's really just replicating a virtual, you know, lecture model that doesn't work. But a person only needs to spend five minutes in a room with someone like Ramsey Musalam to be like, I want to try this. This sounds really great. So I thought about what do I do in the classroom that takes a lot of time? And I don't lecture, but I do introduce SAT vocabulary every week and a half. And it takes 20 minutes per class, and that equates to two hours of my teaching time every week and a half talking at my students. So I decided to record my videos, post them in our Collaborize Classroom site, have students watch them, and then what you're seeing here is they post narratives about the story using, or about the, with the words, 10 of the 15 words, and then they read and reply to their peers. And what I advocate for is how can we play with instructional mediums? How can we wrap information that's delivered online in some dynamic, engaged interaction. They're having discussions, they're debating, because it's going to improve retention, and it combats that whole, you know, virtual sage on the stage criticism, and students retain a whole lot more. So figuring out how we can wrap the content we introduce online in a really dynamic way to get them connected to a community of peers where they can ask questions and bounce ideas off of each other. Um, and then when you get in the classroom, think about where we could really start in terms of evaluation and analysis and collaboration. And I can't, I don't want to speak to technology specifically because I've just shown you a bunch of examples of how I'm using technology, but my last piece of advice is just to be a risk taker. Um, you know, I had this moment, I was planning a um, field trip to Chinatown to complement our Joy Luck Club unit, and man, field trips, ugh. They're just such an art. I mean, that's so challenging to plan. Um, but I love this field trip. And on the field trip, they go through a two-hour docent-led tour, which I love. I'm, like, eating up the whole time. But you always have kids on the tour who are like, is it lunch yet? Are we almost at lunch? And I, I'm kind of like, I feel like you're missing out on the fun of the Chinatown field trip that, by the way, took me forever to plan, right? And so I decided... I'm, I'm teaching a bunch of students who are, you know, they rapid fire off these messages, they capture every moment on Instagram, um, and I decided, I'm gonna, wouldn't it be fun to, like, have an Instagram field trip, like, scavenger hunt? I was an Instagram neophyte. I know nothing about Instagram when I had this brilliant idea for my scavenger hunt, but I didn't let that stop me. If I had thought, hmm... I don't have an Instagram account. I don't really know how that works. I'm not going to do that. I would have missed out on one of the most rewarding activities that has happened with my students in the last few months. So I told my students, hey, I have this idea. How many of you have Instagram? Oh my gosh, so many of them. And I said, anybody who knows a lot about Instagram, could you stick around? I'd love like a quick tutorial. And Mora, a, a wonderful girl in one of my classes, said, I'll do it. It was like I was offering her some kind of prize, you know? <laughs> She's going to stay after and teach me how to do this. And I was so grateful. And in that moment, it was clear to me that these kids don't often have teachers who are asking them for help or asking them to teach them. And then she was so, she just lit up. And so to not be fearful of what we don't know but to embrace those moments. So not only were they like firing off all of these pictures um, and tagging me in them, but I had them include fun facts. So they had to, they had to Google, they do a little research, or they had to be really listening to the docent to add a fun fact to the Instagram scavenger hunt. Um, and what I realized is that when I take those risks, when I just embrace learning something new, I am modeling that for my students. 
the more tools I use, the more risks I take, the more I invite them into my successes and my failures, um, the more likely I am going to create students or students will leave my class with this kind of adaptive expertise and this, this real technology fluency. Um, because literacy isn't just about pen and paper anymore. If kids leave our classroom without cultivating this technology literacy, um, they are shut out from so many opportunities, so much information. And I know there are people in this audience who are thinking, this all sounds good, but like, what if they don't have access at home? I get this question all the time when I'm training teachers. And what I say is, yes, it's a legitimate concern. It's something we have to be mindful of. But lack of access cannot be the excuse that we do not use technology with our students. I don't think the question can stay, well, what if they don't have access? I think the question has to become, how do we get them ask access? How do we get them connected so that they do leave our class with these skills and, and this connection to information and to each other, which is so valuable. Um, and no matter where we stand on the Common Core, because I've heard benefit, you know, people say, oh, here's the positives, here's the negatives, it has given us a common language and, and shared goals. And I think that that opens so many doors for us as educators across the nation to share ideas. Because even on my own campus, I'm so busy, I rarely connect with an educator on the other side of the door. I, I end up connecting more with people on Twitter or following great blogs. Um, and here at Q, I just, you don't have to be, you don't have to leave great at anything. But you can leave excited to try something. You can leave connected to incredible educators doing excited things who, when you go back to your classroom and you try that thing you're excited about and then it doesn't go how you want, you can like tweet them, you can write them, you can be like, hey, this didn't go the way I expected, how can I make it better? And that is how we learn. And it is in those moments when we take the biggest risks that we have the opportunity for the biggest rewards, those magical moments that make this profession worth you know, worth being in despite all of the, the budget issues and the, the other stuff. So I encourage you to seize these opp opportunities at Q. It has been my absolute pleasure to be up here. Have a wonderful three days together.